welcome to our final goat chat for the month. We're so excited that you're here and able to celebrate Goatober. It's one of our favorite months. Um, today on the show with me today, I have Deborah Neiman and Dr. Phil Spondenberg. They're our resident goat experts. Deborah is a contractor with the Shave Them to Save Them program. So you've probably seen her around Facebook answering all these great questions about sheep and wool, but she also has Nigerian dwarf goats. Dr. Phil Spondenberg is our wonderful technical advisor. He's been with us since 1978 and is the driving force behind our uh, conservation priority list, I believe, which is one of the most important things we talk about um, when it comes to rare breeds and saving them. He's also a professor at Virginia Tech of pathology and I think I wrote this down, of pathology and genetics. So we're so excited you're here. And you also have myotonic goats. And so, I do. <laughs> so we're really, really excited to both of you will be here and answer questions from people. So if you have a comment or a question for our goat experts today, go ahead and leave that in our Facebook comments and we will get to those. It's our Ask Us Anything today. So all goat questions are welcome. Please, you know, get those in so we can start answering all of your awesome questions. Um, if y'all are ready, we can uh, get started. I think I had a couple questions from people before we got started while we were chatting before we went live and somebody was asking why you should get a fainting goat or a goat that faints. Because they're the best goats in the world. <laughs> um, they, um, Not that you're biased. <laughs> no, they, um, they don't really faint. They have myotonia congenita and it's a muscle condition where the muscles can't relax quickly. So if they contract the muscles quickly, they can't relax. And so sometimes if they're off balance, they'll fall over. And the, um, the condition itself is painless. And we know that because uh, people have the same condition, a few people, not a whole lot. And it has the um, advantage of they can't climb and they can't jump. So that's a pretty nice goat. And so they're a little bit easier to keep fenced in. In addition, um, they the, the muscle condition actually contributes to more muscling. So they're more heavily muscled than other goats. And that is a real advantage for meat production. And they um, they tend to be parasite resistant and they're good mothers. And they're also very, very quiet. Um, one year, one of our friends came over right as we had weaned the kids. So everybody was kind of hollering and bellowing and they raised Nubian goats. And they just looked at me and they said, but it's so quiet. <laughs> the noise was killing me. So you know, they, they do tend to be quiet. And usually when they're making noise, there's a reason for it. So you have to go out and figure out what that is. Now every now and again, we'll get one doe that for some reason or another just is more talkative or you know, constantly calling for a kid or something like that. And you actually notice that because they're generally quite quiet. They also tend to be uh, parasite resistant. We have goats that we just basically never deworm. So um, now we have others that need them more regularly, but we have some that basically never get dewormed for as long as we have them. So there's some real advantages, especially for low input systems. Oh, that's amazing. Um, Deborah, why do you have Nigerian dwarf goats? What do you enjoy about them? Well, I love their small size and their high butter fat. It really feels like a win-win situation. Um, I also had La Manchas for a while, which are a larger breed. And so they give a lot more milk, but we are not big milk drinkers. We like cheese. And so if you like cheese, then having a goat with high butter fat is, I mean, I have felt like my La Manchas were giving me watered down milk. <laughs> Um, the cheese yield is much higher with the Nigerian milk because of the high butter fat and higher milk solids. And it's just delicious. Like I thought it even tasted better than the La Mancha milk. Interesting. Well, let's see. Somebody else asked before we got started today, what is conservation breeding and what does that mean? Uh, conservation breeding is basically taking care of the population structure of whatever breed it is so that you're sure that you have a place to go next um, and so you want you want good uh, genetic variation out there so that you can keep breeding strong animals that are healthy and hardy a um, couple of examples of really numerous breeds that may not have been paying too much attention to this or holstein cattle and thoroughbred horses and you know they're starting to have some 
not a whole lot of problems, but some problems just in longevity and in overall just disease resistance and environmental adaptation. So trying to pay attention to the genetic diversity that you need to go forward. A lot of times people just worry about production, production, production. You have to worry about the population structure too. You can put those two together and end up with um, really effective breeds that are you know, well adapted and productive both, but you do have to pay attention to both aspects. Sure. Well, following up on some breeding questions that we had earlier, um, what breeding recommendations might you have for someone who can only keep one buck and a few does? That, uh, <laughs> that that's, that's a really, really good question. And it's really, really difficult because um, in most conservation breeding, you're going to have to make a decision. And that decision is you either get to keep the bucks forever or you get to keep the does forever. Um, because if you keep both of them forever, then you end up in a genetic dead end. So in this situation, if you have one buck and a few does, then obviously next year, any dolings that are born, are from that buck. And so then you, you'd be mating a sire back to the daughters. You might get away with that for one generation, but you can't get away with it for several generations in a row. So um, in, in that situation, my recommendation is basically just fall madly in love with your uh, does and then don't fall so madly in love with your buck. <laughs> and just, you know, you can replace them every year or two. In my own situation, we usually use four or five or six bucks a year in different little pens. Um, with varying degrees of success at the separation, but that's the idea. And what we'll do is um, we will actually use the bucks when they're about 18 months old. And we'll go ahead and sell them. And if they're really, you know, we try to sell them for breeding if we think they're really, really good. And if they're not so good, we just basically sell them over the scales. Some people can do that emotionally and some people can't. Um, and that has the advantage of a buck and never really getting real, real old. Uh, we've had experience with bucks when they had about 9, 10, 11, 12 years old. They kind of started tearing stuff up. Now, we only had one that was mean, so they weren't usually tearing people up, which was nice. But you know, they'd start, you know, just wearing the fences down and stuff like that. And just I, I discovered as I was getting older that it was easier not to put up with that. So young bucks, ancient does, it just a, it works for us. Great. Zephyr, do you do any selection for your Nigerian dwarf goats? Um, yeah, definitely. I'm because our main goal has always been milk. Um, I will not buy a buck unless he comes from a doe that's been on milk test, so that I have an idea of what to expect from the offspring. Um, Nigerians were on the conservation priority list when I chose them. Um, in fact, my first doe, her registration number was like 1000 something. Um, so like she was very, very um, way back there in terms of the genetics. Now I think, I think they're over a hundred thousand. Like they, they went from, you know, rare to the most popular breed. And so unfortunately when something gets popular, it's like, it's like what I've heard dog breeders complain about for years. You know, if you have like the 101 Dalmatian movie, lots of people start raising Dalmatians and you start to see a lot of problems. And that's unfortunately is what we have seen with the Nigerians now um, that, you know, they got so popular so fast that people were not calling. They had no criteria at all for breeding. Um, I look at my baby bucks and say, give me a reason to keep you. <laughs> um, you know, what you see, unfortunately, what you see a lot on Facebook is um, people will say, you know, I have this cute little buck for sale. He's got spots and blue eyes and he's pulled and I'm, you know, and, and he's $50 as a weather or $200 as a buck. Um, and nobody should be selling a goat like that. Like, um, you know, it's not a matter of like, oh, he's so cute. You know, you, I only keep bucks out of the best does in my herd. And um, meaning that like they they have to be the top milkers. They have to have really good teats and udders. Um, otherwise the boys are just, they're going to be castrated. Um and so, and that's really important rather than just, 
you know, oh, he's cute. He's got spots. He's got blue eyes. Um, I happen to have a blue eyed buck, which um, came from a goat that I didn't even know had blue eyes until he was here <laughs> because that's how little, like, I don't pay attention to it. You know, it's like, I look at the milk records and I look at the utter photos and I know when I was new, I, I was visiting people's websites, you know, back in 2002, 2003 and seeing pictures of goats udders. And I had no idea what I was looking at. And I was just like, man, this is weird. Why do people have pictures of their goats udders up here? Um, and then, well, once you start milking a goat, like you, then it starts to make sense, you know, like some of those udders are much harder to milk. Some are easier to milk. Um, and you, then you start to understand it. Um, but I also see someone else just asked a question about Nigerians too, about why they became so popular. Um, wanted to, yes. Karita wanted I, to know why do Nigerians become so popular? Yeah, um, their size has a lot to do with it because they're small. You know, most people who get Nigerians, um, their 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 experience usually is like um, dogs, cats, and maybe chickens. And so, going to a Nigerian is, is I mean, it's really kind of like going. They're about the size of a Labrador Retriever, Golden Retriever, and. So it's not at all scary for people. Sometimes if people have no livestock experience at all, they are more um, intimidated by larger goats. Plus, you may not need that much milk. Like I, if somebody contacts me and says, you know, I have six children and we go through three gallons of milk a day, how many goats do I need? I would say, I'd probably be looking at, you know, like, Alpines or Sonnens or something if you go through a lot of fluid milk. Um, but for us, the Nigerians were perfect because their average is like a quart a day, but they peak at closer to half a gallon a day if they're from good milking lines. Um, and that's something really important to remember too. I just cringe when I hear somebody say that they're just going to go pick up a buck at the sale barn or something because like that there's a saying in goats that your buck is half your herd. And if you pick up a buck who came from a doe that was a horrible producer, he's going to have daughters that are probably going to be horrible producers. So you know, it's like what you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear or something like that. <laughs> yes. Thank you so. for that question, Karina. In Let's see, somebody else had emailed me earlier. I wanted to know, for someone who is a new goat breeder, how can they tell if a goat is good for breeding? Probably the, um, the best thing to do is to find experienced breeders, find somebody that's willing to you know, walk through a herd with you, point out the strengths, point out the weaknesses. Um, structure carries through. Structure is really, really important. And so um, paying on it sounds really stupid, but I mean, if, you, if you're paying attention to the to the feet and the legs, you know, usually you've got a pretty decent goat. If it's got you know, strong conformation there, that strong conformation tends to carry throughout. Um, and then also the set of the jaw and the set of the teeth can be important because when everything matches up right, um, then they basically last longer because their teeth wear well. So, you know, paying attention to those and learning how to do that um, is probably one of the important things. So, you know, how those legs are structured from the side and also from the back and the front, and then just you know, body capacity, you know, that they're ruminants and a ruminant is a fermentation vat. We had one doe that was about as broad as she was long and everybody thought she was always pregnant, which she wasn't because she looked like that right after she was kidding. You know, and she was a really, I mean, she was a really, really good goat because you could feed her anything and she was going to process it. And the answer to this question varies a lot depending on whether you're talking about meat goats or dairy goats. Um, so, like, I could talk for an hour and in response to this. <laughs> and some of the stuff I was talking about already, it's like, it's not just the goat, you know, it's like if you're talking about dairy, it's really about the mom. I bought a new buck. Um, 10 years ago. And the person who sold it to me was emailing, what do you think of him? What do you think of him? And I said, I'll tell you in about three years when his daughters have freshened <laughs> until then 
I'm withholding judgment because that's what it's all about for me. It's all about what kind of daughters he throws. So if he, if he has daughters that have teats that are hard to milk, small udders, not good production, then he, he doesn't really have a place in a milking herd. And Phil, uh, yours are meat goats. Is there something specific you look for? Well, you, you look for good, but I mean, behavior, good mothering ability, temperament, and then, you know, it's structure. So structure is important. And then just function. And of course, function, you can't, you can't look at it. You have to measure it and, you know, you know, basically, are they twinning? Are they having singles? You can look at a group of bucks and the biggest one may well be a single instead of a t twin or a triplet. You probably want that twin or a triplet because you want that ability to have multiple kids, you know, back in your dough herd. Great. Oh, and speaking of number of kids, I can add, I can throw something in there too. Oh, <laughs> um, because Nigerians are known to throw high multiples. And um, new people always think this is so exciting. Like you get a litter of goats um, because they can have four or five. And, and I, I understand that when I was new, I was so excited the first time we had quads. Um, two weeks later, I was not so excited when I was having to tube feed one of those kids because she was so starving and so weak that she couldn't even stand up anymore. And after a few more years, <laughs> um, I was no longer so in love with these high multiple kids. Um, high multiple does. And I've actually, for the most part, we've had six sets of quintuplets. Um, and I've, for the most part, stopped breeding the goats that do that because um, when they have five, I just automatically take two to bottle feed. And um, so it's not as much fun. And that's unfortunately something you see getting tossed around on Facebook is, is, a horrible assumption that a goat can feed however many kids she gives birth to. Um, well, there, um, and the subtle, there's some subtle points here that are really, really uh, matching the goat to the system is extremely important. And it turns out that the more, you know, it's logical when you think about it, but there's also biological reasons for it. That the more kids a doe has, the higher her subsequent milk production is going to be. So if you had, you know, doe A, and she had a single kid or doe A, and she had five kids, she's actually gonna give more milk if she has five kids. Now you think about the last couple thousand years of selecting goats for milk production. What that means is you are inherently selecting them, you know, usually for high levels of prolificacy, but then you wanna be able to milk the goat. Now, any, any really, really good mama goat worth her salt is gonna have those kids and then she's gonna beat you off when you try to milk her because that's that's her job. Um, and so you're also gonna be selecting them for you know pretty low levels of mothering ability. Now that's not uniformly true, but it's 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 pretty widely true. Uh, the best example is sheep where East Frisian sheep may well have four and five kids, or four and five lambs, excuse me, at a time. And that those lambs may actually weigh eight, 10 pounds a piece. And then they are perfectly happy to walk off and leave them <laughs> because your job is to milk her out and to feed, feed the lambs. And if you're, if you're interested in high milk production, you want that because you're going to pull those kids or lambs and you are going to artificially raise them. You're going to bottle feed them or, you know, lamb bar feed them or whatever you're going to do. And so again, it's, it's matching, it's matching the animal to the system. So if you have a system where you're milking the goat after the goat's raised its own kids, you don't want five. If you're in a more commercial system where you want to have those kids, you want, you're willing to bottle raise them off of the dam so that you can milk the dam out, then you may well want four or five kids because you're actually going to be boosting the milk production from that doe. My situation, um, some of the does have triplets and do pretty well. Now, of course, we're not milking anybody, so... Um, but, you know, and some of, them, some of them can count to four, not very many of them, and not ever, not all of them can count up to three. So, you, you know, you do, you want to match the goat to the system and your goals to the system. So, yes, in some situations you want five. In some situations you don't want more than one because the environment won't handle it and neither will the management uh, system. So match the goat to the system. 
That's my answer to pretty much everything is it depends. <laughs> like there's just so little that's engraved in stone when it comes to goats. Um, and because with like with the kids, when you have multiple kids, it's not just about the goat's production. It's also about the personality of the kids and kind of when I was, and, it, and it's a transition. I've been raising goats for 18 years. So it's been a transition in terms of like how I feel about multiple kids and, um, kind of in the middle of all this, I think one of my middle sets of quintuplets, I said, okay, um, because I've had kids almost die of starvation, um, when there's so many, when there's four or five. And so when this doe had five, I thought, okay, this time I'm going to be smart. I'm going to go in there and I'm going to offer everybody a bottle twice a day. And if somebody wants it, great. If they don't, fine. And I went in there after, after like two days and there was this poor little kid, like four kids fighting over those two teats and this poor little doe in the corner. And I shouldn't even say little because she, her birth weight was the one that was right in the middle. Um, so she wasn't even the smallest. She was standing in the corner with her head and ears down looking like Eeyore. Um, and, and I picked her up and when I stuck the bottle in her mouth, she was like, Oh, thank you. Um, because she just didn't want to be in that fray fighting with those other four kids for the two teats. And, um, so she was very easy. Unfortunately, some kids are what I call happy to be starving. Um, and that's where you've got the two, that's where you wind up with a two week old kid that you're tube feeding because they're like, no, no, I don't need a bottle. I'm perfectly fine. Um, trying to nurse off mom with my other siblings, <laughs> And then they can't always do it. Um, so, and so I, you know, you only have to find yourself in an emergency situation with a kid that's, you know, got two or three hooves in the grave already before you start to get um, skeptical. <laughs> and then you start weighing kids to see like, you know, okay, because you can't trust your eyeballs. So you weigh them to make sure if you're dam raising, I mean, if you're bottle feeding, if you take all the kids and bottle feed them, that's a completely different scenario. So again, it depends. Um, but, um, but the, the dough making enough to feed kids is like only true to a point. Like they're not unlimited on my website. I do the math and, and say like, this is how much a goat this is how much a kid needs to thrive. Um, and if they don't get that, then um, you're going to see more problems with coccidiosis because their immune system is not going to be great. And then they're just, they're not going to gain weight properly. Um, and I get a lot of messages from people who are in a situation like that, where they've got a kid that's a month old and it, it weighs what a one week old should weigh or two week old. The other real important thing to get kids a, a good start is to make sure that they have about 20% of their weight in colostrum in that first 24 hours. That makes a huge difference. And so that actually solves a whole bunch of problems downstream, gives them a better start, and then those, those kids are going to grow better than the ones that don't get quite enough. Yes. So this question kind of started with a misconception. Are there other goat misconceptions that you think people should be aware of? That goats can eat anything. <laughs> like, I, it just blows me away that I still hear that one. You know, people are like, so they can eat anything, right? I, I've had people contact me, you know, saying they wanted to keep a goat in their basement and or their backyard or and I'm like, no, anything does not mean tin cans. Anything means your roses, your daylilies, <laughs> you know, all the things you don't want them to eat. So, you know, you can't have them in your yard or your basement. Um, I have a whole big long series of myths, but that's one that's just super common. Well, are there any misconceptions that you get a lot? Uh, no. <laughs> you can say no, it's okay. <laughs> no, I'm just trying to think because, uh, you know, I mean, everybody asks, I mean, they'll ask, how are the goats doing? You know, I mean, yeah, I enjoy my goats very, very much, but sheep are going to heaven and goats are going to hell. And, I mean, there's a reason for that. Um, and this also depends on the breed, you know, and again, right system, right breed, good to go. 
if you go to a Nubian herd, they're all lying in a big pile humming, and they're making this noise that no goat makes. They all love each other. Go to an alpine herd, there's a fight going on 24 hours a day, every day of the year. I mean, different goat, you know. I mean, but it's really, really hard to kill a Nubian because they are, I mean, an alpine, because they're going to get out there and live. Um, and, and if it, it's at somebody else's expense, that's the way it is. And there they go, you know. But um, they, you know, they're individuals. Uh, some of them are sweeter than others. You know, we've had different ones that were, you know, every herd will have a lead goat. And what we're always eager for is that lead goat that um, runs the place with gentle persuasion instead of overt tyranny. And we, we've had both kinds. I mean, we, we had one, one doe that was just horrible, very, very productive, very nice big goat, horrible to everybody, including me. Um, yeah. And to the to the extent that usually usually they're quite clannish, and so the the, the um, kids will stay with their mothers, you know, for the rest of their life. And in her case, once their kids got weaned, they said, "We're out of here. This is no way to live, and we're not participating in this." Um, and, you know, and they just went off and formed their own little family, left mom to her own devices. So you know, that's and then they they, they are in fact quite quite picky eaters. It needs to be clean. It needs to be high quality. Or they're they're simply not interested. Now they will they will eat. You know, in, in international development, it turns out that you know, most places where there's overgrazing, the cows were in there first. They ate everything a cow was going to eat, and then they couldn't make it anymore. Then they had sheep for a while, and then the sheep ate everything the sheep were going to eat, and pretty soon that didn't work out so well. And then they had goats because that's the last thing that'll eat the last thing out there. And then the development officer comes in and says, look what the goats did. And it's like, no, that's not what the goats did. That's what poor management did. Because um, it was a combination, the whole trajectory of the cows first and the sheep second and the goats finally. And that's all that survived at the end. And then you look at the disaster and there it is. So they have to be managed, but they, you know, they have to be managed well. And they like to eat good stuff. Sure. sure. Let's see. Let's see, we just, just had a question, question from, from Laurel, Laurel come, in, come in, and, and she, she wanted, wanted to know, to know. I don't know why I'm getting feedback. <laughs> um, any recommendations for herd queen who turned aggressive to other does at four years old? Uh, be prepared for it get to worse, because <laughs> it's going to get worse. Um, I, in my herd, um, most of the goats have horns. Now, I realize that's not going to be everybody's style. Um, and so actually if I get one that I want to keep and that really has turned aggressive, I'll tip the horns so that you can't really do much damage. Um, other than that, it, it, rehabilitating them, good luck on that. You can, you can get them to where they're not going to challenge you with a squirt gun, but you, 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 <laughs> you're not going to be out there 24 hours a day. And once they've turned aggressive to everybody else, I mean, I've had pulled those that were aggressive herd queens, didn't have horns. They just reach over and bite ears. You know, which I mean, talk about cheating. Mm -hmm. So I, I've never had luck uh, rehabilitating one that turned aggressive. I found ways to live with them, but I haven't found ways to dial back the aggression. Yeah, my goats don't have horns, um, but like Phil said, they will bite each other's ears. So if you look at the goats in my herd, you'll see some of them have little uh, parts of their ear missing, and that's because somebody bit them. So, um, and there's not like, I totally agree. There's really not much you can do. Um, I back, I had my La Manchas and the Nigerians together and La Manchas are like, they weigh about twice as much as a Nigerian. So it's obvious that one of them is probably going to be your herd queen. Cause she you knows she's got a huge physical advantage. And, um, and that was what happened. And she would not let anybody, um, eat from her hay feeder if they were like, like she had to have this much room, you know, on the hay feeder. She would be like spinning her head and smacking anybody that got anywhere close to her um, at the hay feeder. And so, and though, if you have a, one like that, I, because sometimes I get this question from people and they're worried about other goats, especially if you only have two or three, they're worried about the other goats being able to get enough to eat is that you just need to have separate hay feeders and have them far enough apart that um and what you'll see sometimes is that that, that aggressive goat's going to run back and forth <laughs> between the hay feeders but it does slow them down from budding because they're so busy 
doing that. But then at least like the other goats have a chance to eat. Thank you, Laurel. That was a great question. Tracy wants to know, can you offer suggestions for a first time freshener? Anything to watch for as far as whether she needs help kidding? 30, 30, 30. Um, you wait 30 minutes after you notice she's starting labor and then if she's not making any progress, you know, you go in and make sure that the positioning's right. And you, you can do that pretty easily because you have a perfect anatomic model right in front of you because you got a goat. And, you know, ideally the you know, two little front feet are coming out and the nose is on top of them, you know, just like this. And, um, you know, that, that can help. Um, for the first timers. Um, and then uh, usually what's gonna happen is that the feet are coming out, but the elbows are back. And if it's a small doling, you can actually straighten out those front feet and that narrows the diameter of what's gonna run out and that can help her quite a bit. But usually just waiting is the best thing you can do. Great. Thank and you, um, just a quick addition to that, because I get this a lot and I think Phil maybe meant 30 minutes after they start pushing um, because I have people thinking their goats are in labor when they're totally fine. Like people send me videos and I'm like, she's walking around, she's eating, she's drinking, she's not making any noise. Why do you think she's in labor? Um, <laughs> so um, that's probably a big thing. Um, but if they're screaming bloody murder, you know, and throwing themselves down and pushing their legs out and stuff, then that's serious. Thank you, Tracy. That's a good question. Allison wants to know, what are your favorite ways to consume goat milk or goat meat? <laughs> Any goat meat's okay. My favorite is when they roast it in Argentina, but that's part of being Argentina. And I'm wild about goat, che uh, goat cheeses. I, <laughs> well, I think milk is the best use for milk is cheese. It's pretty awesome. Um, and for goat meat, so the thing, I don't know if anybody else will have this experience, but I did not, I don't like it when you take a, take a beef or pork recipe and just swap out the goat. To me, it just tastes wrong. I think it's because my brain sees it and is expecting it to taste a certain way and it doesn't. Um, so I have looked for um, recipes, like specific Middle Eastern recipes, African recipes, Central America, Caribbean recipes, you know, goat curries, things that are specifically made for goat. Um, and I pretty much love all of those. Like I, I do, we do a goat stir fry with a peanut sauce and um, we do a shepherd's pie with goat, um, which is really good. Um, there's so many good recipes out there. If you, if you start looking for the ones from people who are eating goat rather than just trying to swap out for beef or pork. So you said you roast it in Argentina or is there a specific way they, that they do it? They build a real, real low fire and they roast it slowly for hours. And it's quite good, but you're always out in the countryside, so it's it's the whole it's the whole experience. That sounds delicious. Um, do y'all make your own goat cheese? We don't milk the goats, so no. Um, Deb does, but we don't. <laughs> yeah, we make lots of we make lots of cheese. We've made I think eighteen different kinds, and the stuff that we make the most is cheddar, mozzarella, chev, feta. Those are the ones we do the most, um, but we, I kind of, I guess I could say other than blue cheese, there's, I haven't met a cheese I didn't like. I, I never have met one. I, well, no, I never <laughs> met one I didn't like, even the blue ones. Sometimes I have to eat those all by myself, but that's okay too. <laughs> this means more for you. That's the idea. Exactly. <laughs> yep. I eat a lot of cheese in my house. I don't think uh, I don't like any cheeses. <laughs> oh, and then um, actually my husband just made a pumpkin cheesecake using uh, goat cheese. Ooh, 
That sounds delicious. Yeah. Recipes on my website. I should share that. <laughs> Minor plug. <laughs> yeah. It's a really good recipe. That's fantastic. Let's see. We've got another question. Is there a heritage goat breed that would be especially good for beginners? Well, um, I have my atomic goats, so I'm biased. But, you know, they are quiet. They are they don't climb, and so and they're parasite resistant, so they're they're actually fairly easy. Um, Spanish goats are also quite durable, um, but they can jump <laughs> and they can climb, and so you know that that's going to be a problem there. And also, a lot of those are desert adapted instead of human adapted, so the parasite resistance varies considerably, strain to strain. Um, and then a lot of people interested in more, you know, high levels of dairy production might be interested in the overhostlies. So that would be another one. But those those would fit into a traditional, you know, dairy specific system. Whereas the myotonic goats and the uh, Spanish goats fit more of a range production system. Either one. Great question, Karina. Lauren wants to know when she's. When I see goat meat in stores, it seems to only be cubes of meat. Do they sell cuts like loin and chops? It's, it's just going to, it's going to depend on your market, you know, basically. Um, they're, they're cubing it because it's, that's basically what their demand is. And so if you wanted loins or chops or something like that, um, you'd probably have to ask for it specifically. And a lot of times it's going into stews and to curries and things like that. So um, in Argentina, you know, it's the whole goat. I mean, they don't cut into anything. Um, so yeah, it just depends on the market. So talk to your local farmer, see if you can get a whole goat. That's what I tell people. Cause then you can get the, get it cut up exactly the way you want. We sell goat meat to, um, a grocery store and that's all they wanted was cubes. They didn't want anything else. Great question, Lauren. Thank you for that. I think I have one more emailed question and they wanted to know, what should you do if a goat has a good body but a fatal flaw, like a bad temperament or a parasite resistance? To quote Deb, it depends. <laughs> um, nothing, nothing's perfect. And so basically what you do is you try to um, balance strengths and weaknesses. And so, um, you know, if she's got a bad temperament, made her to a pacifist if you have one. Um, if or, you know, parasite resistance made into somebody that's got really, really good parasite resistance. What you you try, but I mean, you don't want to double up on the, on the defect. So you don't want, um, and then you'll just have to kind of figure that out and figure out how tired you are of it. Um, I do have one goat that's really, really flighty. And it turned out that, I mean, she is a very, very pretty goat. She had a kid this year, doling, and just as flighty or worse than she is. So I, you know, I, I sold the dole and kept the dog. We'll try again next year and see if I can straighten that out. You know, but it, it's it's always a juggling. You're always juggling one thing with another. On the parasite resistance, you just have to decide how important that is to you. And if it's um, if it's real, real important, you know, then and, and you, if you're having real trouble managing the parasite uh, susceptibility, then good body isn't going to really do much for you. But if you can, you know, check out the kids that she produces and maybe make some progress there. That's the best strategy. Absolutely. Well, I think that's all of our questions for today. Are there any challenges that you've had raising myotonics or Nigerian dwarfs? Well, I mean, I... <laughs> <laughs> You're like, there's so many. <laughs> um, you know, some of them learn to ignore electric fences, for example. Um, they're not they're, they're they're relatively easy you know yeah sure there's challenges you know one year we had we buy hay and one year it was really really poor quality and you know trying to make up for that was really really difficult and that set us back a year you know so there's, there's challenges like that so just attention to details and managing those details so that you can have a good outcome is an important thing i think the biggest um, so one of the biggest problems that we ever had was parasites. Um, and I started raising goats in 2002. So to be fair, nobody really had the answers then. Um, and um, so we wound up with complete dewormer resistance in our herd. I had goats, you know, I have 
three to five years into having goats, I was just sitting there watching goats die and there was nothing, nothing that anybody could do, nothing, you know, that the vets could do. None of the drugs worked. Um, and now we do know a lot more. Unfortunately, nothing online ever dies. So a lot of the information on dealing with worms is the old stuff is still out there. Um, and so people are still doing things that can wind up causing dewormer resistance. Um, and so that's probably like, that is one thing that I think people really, really, really need to educate themselves about. There's a website called wormx.info that is um, run by the American Consortium for Small Ruminant Parasite Control. And they've got all the latest recommendations in there. It's like all based on research and everything. And um, I also have a ton of stuff on my website and people like that's just something people really need to know. Like, it's really sad when I get an email from somebody that says, what do I need to feed my goat to put weight on it? <laughs> and it's like, um, if your goat is underway, that's kind of could be worms, you know, like check the eyelids. Um, body can poor body condition is one sign of parasitism. It's it's unlikely that you're the goat doesn't have enough available to eat. Um, it's Parasites is a very common problem and um, it's made worse by people using dewormers on a regular basis um, because that's what is ultimately gonna lead to dewormer resistance is overuse of the dewormers because all the worms get exposed to it. Building on that, Charlene wanted to know how you can tell if a goat has parasites. So we said one thing was underweight. Are there other tells? Well, I, you know, we're getting into a, a 15, 15 hour series. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. The, the main the main parasite of uh, importance sucks blood, and so they'll be anemic. And like Deb said, you can look at the lining of the eyelid. And you can actually judge how anemic they are. And if they're anemic, they may well have a pretty high burden of that specific parasite. Great. Thank you, Charlie. They have that all that information on wormx.info too. They have the five-point check, which includes checking the inside of the eyelids and the body condition and stuff. Are there other resources people can use or that you found really helpful as you've been raising goats? Well, my website, <laughs> shameless plug, thriftyhomesteader.com. There's 125 articles on there about goats. So, and also my podcast, I, for the love of goats, um, just two weeks ago, I interviewed Susan Shanian about the proper use of dewormers so that um, people don't wind up with dewormer resistance. And I've also interviewed other researchers on there as well to talk about like roundworms and then some of the other problems. Well, do you have a shameless plug? I think you've uh, written a few books and you're an expert on, on several things. Yeah, well, then most of what I do is just teach here. So, um, you know, that's, <laughs> and a lot of that, I just come to school here and I'll teach you. <laughs> Excellent. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for your wonderful questions today. Thank you to Deborah and Phil. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to answer everyone's questions and help us learn more about goats and breeding and all the wonderful things. And so I'm going to say, have a great afternoon, everyone. Tune in again next week where it's going to be Turkey Month. So celebrating in November. Have a great afternoon.